Professor Ilke Göçmen, then from Ankara University Law Faculty, uh, will be presenting his paper on trade and sustainable development chapters in EU's trade agreements and their potential impact on the vision of EU trade, Turkey trade framework. Ilke Hocam, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see the screen, by the way, this time? Yes, but not as the full screen. Are you showing the full screen? Uh, not because uh, um, I think that it, it, it might cause some problems. So I will right. use this screen, <laughs> so that's right. okay. Good. So yes. okay, thank you, Gülüm Hoca. Uh, so my presentation topic is titled as Trade and Sustainable Development Chapters in EU Trade Agreements and their potential impact on the revision of EU Turkey trade framework. Now we know that the EU and Turkey trade framework has been planned to be revised and among others, trade and sustainable development will be under negotiation. So in this regard, the relationship between trade and sustainable development can be explained briefly as follows. Sustainable development is an aim for international community and trade is a policy which pursues, among others, the aim of sustainable development. Hence, to achieve sustainable development, trade policy must be accompanied by some flanking measures to mitigate negative social and environmental impacts and to enhance positive social and environmental impacts. Thus, ESD chapters in trade agreements are intended to do that, generally. Against this background, the aim of my presentation is to answer the following question. Considering the EU's practice, what standard and or possible arrangements can be expected as regards the TSD in the revision of EU-Turkey trade framework? In order to answer this question, firstly, I will shed light on the revision of EU-Turkey trade framework in general, and in particular, with regard to the trade and sustainable development matters. And secondly, based on the basics of the TSD chapter in EU's trade agreements, I will try to assess what can be expected as regards TSD in this revision of EU-Turkey trade framework. To begin with, EU and Turkey relations have two aspects, as already mentioned by other panelists. The one is the association relationship, under which mainly a customs union was established in 1996 and which covers primarily industrial goods. On the other hand, there is the accession relationship, and according to that relationship, Turkey has been a candidate state for the EU membership since 1999 and has been continuing accession negotiations since 2005. When I talk about the EU-Turkey trade framework, mainly I refer to the customs union between the parties, which is based on the association relationship, hence designed as a transitional regime. Especially in the last 10 years, the deficiencies in the trade framework has become prominent and it has become outdated. So we can easily see that the EU trade framework has been in need of revision. And there is a procedural and a substantive dimension to this revision process. In general, the procedural dimension of this revision process dates back to 2014. But the most important legal step was taken uh, in 21 December 2016, when the Commission recommended to open negotiations with Turkey. Nonetheless, the Council hasn't authorized the opening of negotiations yet. On the contrary, for instance, in 26 June 2018, it noted that no further work is foreseen in this regard. Particularly as regards TSD matters, we can highlight two points. Firstly, the Commission, already in its impact assessment of 2016, analyzed the environmental, social, and human rights impacts of the policy options in this revision process. But more importantly, there will be a sustainability impact assessment which will be made by external consultants and simultaneously with the negotiations, and which will analyze the potential economic, social, human rights, and environmental impacts of the eventual agreement between the parties. I think that it will probably have effects on the negotiations of the TST chapter between European Union and Turkey. Now, substantively, 
When we turn to the substantive dimension of this revision process, in general, we can divide it into two. On the one hand, there is a need to modernize the customs union, and on the other hand, there is a need to enhance the trade framework. And the estimators fall under the enhancement of the trade framework as they are considered as part of new elements relevant or even essential to trade. Particularly as regards the estimators, we can highlight two points based on the Commission's impact assessment of 2016. Uh, according to the Commission, first of all, revised EU Turkey trade framework will include the TST chapter. So that is certain. And also, the Commission refers to CETA, EU Canada Trade Agreement. I think which seems to have the most advanced TST chapter is to be taken as a model. But let me note that TST chapters are under constant development, which can be seen not only in EU's recent trade agreements, but also in EU's policy documents. Uh, since the Commission's impact assessment of 2016, EU with or without its member states concluded trade agreements with Japan, Singapore, Vietnam, and United Kingdom in 2020. Uh, let me note that the European Parliament considers that the TST chapter of the agreement with United Kingdom as a model for future trade agreements. But on the other hand, the Commission has various policy documents directly or indirectly related with TST chapters, such as the 15-point action plan of 2018, which has been currently under review by now. Uh, this background brings me to the second part of my presentation. And here, uh, since it is not possible to consume the TST chapters in all their extents, I will focus on the basics of the TST chapters. Uh, when I talk about the basics of the TST chapters, I generally mean the main commitments, implementation, and enforcement. Here I will try to answer the following question. What is the standard and or possible arrangements as regards the basics of the TST chapters? Under main commitments, there are two types of general obligations flowing from TST chapters. On the one hand, they relate to the international agreements on labor and environment protection. Under the obligations relating to the international agreements, there are three main obligations. Firstly, there is an obligation to ratify further international agreements. In some trade agreements, the parties undertake to consider to ratify international agreements on labor and or environment protection. And in some other trade agreements, the parties undertake to uh, make efforts to ratify international agreements on labor and or environment protection. Let me note that this last obligation was interpreted in EU South Korea Dispute Settlement Panel Report of 2021. By the way, this is the only dispute, panel, uh, dispute settlement panel report uh, regarding the EU and the trade uh, and sustainable development chapters of its trade agreements. So according to that panel report, this is a binding legal commitment but an obligation of best endeavors. Hence, alternatively, in the future, uh, the EU might think that fixing a date or an ex-ante requirement for such a ratification is more uh, relevant uh, in their TSD chapters, more appropriate in their TSD chapters. Secondly, there is an obligation to effectively implement the ratified international agreements on labor and or environment protection. This is a standard arrangement which can be found in all trade agreements. So we can ask, what is the added value of this obligation? I think it renders the effective implementation of agreements on labor and environment protection, this time as a new obligation under the trade agreement. And thirdly, there is an obligation to uphold certain internationally recognized core standards and or principles. In the first place, all agreements, all trade agreements of the EU refer to core labor standards, such as the evolution of child labor. And here, we again have the EU South Korea Dispute Settlement Panel Report of 2021. And according to that panel report, this is a binding new obligation and provided that the core labor standard is also self-executing, the other party may rely on it. So an interesting development occurred in EU a United Kingdom trade agreement because it covers core environmental principles such as the polluter pays principle. 
In this regard, since the European Parliament considered the TST chapter of the agreement with the United Kingdom as a model for future trade agreements, I think it will probably be on the table when we consider the revision of EU-Turkey trade framework. Under main commitments, the other general obligation relates to the domestic rules on labor and environment protection. Under the obligations relating to domestic rules, there are two main obligations. Firstly, in all trade agreements, there is an obligation to uphold levels of protection. This obligation consists of two elements. On the one hand, there is the non-regression clause, and on the other hand, there is the non-enforcement clause. Respectively, according to these clauses, reducing levels of environmental and labor protection is prohibited, and failing to effectively enforce environmental and labor law is prohibited, but provided that it has a link with trade between the parties. The condition of a link with trade between the parties has been worded in some trade agreements as in a manner affecting trade, and in some other trade agreements as to encourage trade. Let me note that some agreements use both of these terminology. Although there is no panel report in relation to the European Union in this regard, in comparison to the United States Guatemala dispute panel report of 2017, we can say that this is a high threshold to prove. I mean the threshold to prove a link with trade uh, when there is a domestic rules uh, infringement. Nonetheless, the obligation to uphold levels of protection uh, under domestic laws on the condition that there is a link with trade has become the standard arrangement, which can be found in all trade agreements again. Secondly, only in EU-Canada and EU-United Kingdom trade agreement, there is an obligation to comply with or effectively enforce domestic laws, but it is subject to the obligation to uphold levels of protection under domestic law again, which refers, I think, the, uh, to, to the link between to the link with trade between the parties. Uh, these agreements foresee some detailed rules, for example, on access to remedies or procedural guarantees, such as ensuring that administrative and judicial proceedings are available. Um, I think that since the Commission referred to EU-Canada trade agreement as a model for uh, the revision of EU-Turkey trade framework, and since the European Parliament considered the EU-United Kingdom agreement, uh, it is TST chapter, as a future model for future trade agreements, I think the obligation to comply with or effectively enforce domestic laws will probably be taken into account when, uh, we talk, when uh, there will be the revision of EU-Turkey trade framework. Next, in relation to the implementation of TSD chapters, there is a specific institutional setting. On the one hand, there is the governmental setting, and on the other hand, there is the non-governmental setting. Under governmental setting, especially, there is a specialized committee on TSD matters. This committee composed, is composed by senior officials of the parties and tasked to oversee the implementation of the TSD chapter. Uh, on the non-governmental setting, which is the more distinguishing part of this institutional setting, by the way, uh, this refers to the involvement of civil society, but to the different degrees and in different trade agreements. But uh, to summarize, here we especially have a domestic advisory groups. Uh, these are composed of civil society and tasked to oversee the implementation of the TSD chapters. So, the governmental setting is the base arrangement, which can be found in all trade agreements. On the other hand, the non-governmental setting differs from one trade agreement to another. Thus, it seems that during the EU-Turkey revision process, the extent of involvement of civil society and the extent of role of civil society, such as whether the domestic advisory group's competence will cover only the TSD chapters or the whole agreement, will be subject to negotiations under the EU-Turkey trade framework revision process. And lastly, in relation to the enforcement of the TSD chapters, we should note that they have their own dispute settlement mechanism, which excludes recourse to the general dispute settlement mechanism of the trade agreement or the other relevant agreement. Very shortly, under this dispute settlement mechanism, following the government consultations, there may be a panel of experts which will present non-binding reports or reports to the parties in a fixed time. Thus, under the standard arrangements, 
TSMs are not binding and there are no sanctions under the TSD chapters. However, let me note that this has been currently under review by the Commission. So to conclude, from EU's perspective, bilaterally, we can say that EU's negotiation position is to take the standard NHMAS in TSD chapters as a base. But unilaterally, let me note that EU tries to strengthen the implementation and enforcement of its trade agreements in general, and its TSD chapters in particular. For instance, in 2020, a very recent development, I think, they appointed a chief trade enforcement officer to achieve this aim, but also they created a mechanism called single entry point to collect the complaints about the trade agreements and TSD chapters from the relevant parties and uh, try to strengthen the implementation and enforcement of them. And from Turkey's perspective, I think that the revised EU Turkey trade framework, if there will be one, of course, will probably hold the broadest TSD chapter in comparison to Turkey's other trade agreements. Thank you, Gülüm Hocam. Nilke Hocam, thank you very much. Um, if uh, it is fine for everyone, uh, I would like to continue with Professor Sanem Baikal since the subjects uh, of two presentations complement uh, each other. Professor Sanem Baikal is now Professor of European Union Law at Top Eti University. However, she is our beloved professor from Ankara University Faculty of Law. Uh, we are uh, very much indebted to her because uh, we've worked with her for years. And she is now uh, the unknown power behind our projects. So um, it is an honor for me uh, to give the floor to Professor Sanem Baika. Uh, and she will be presenting on the question of uh, does Ankara Agreement continue to provide a viable legal framework for Turkey-EU trade relations, limits and prospects? Please, Hocam. Uh, thank you, Gülüm Hocam. Uh, thank you, İlke Hocam. And to all the participants uh, who are uh, speaking during the conference and also uh, everyone who are uh, listening to our uh, discussions and also uh, contributing by asking questions and uh, presenting their own opinions. I'm very happy to be uh, with you uh, today uh, with my uh, with my dear colleagues who really invite me to all those uh, academic events for me to uh, keep going. So uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here and I will try to be very brief in order to analyze whether Ankara Agreement after all the developments in uh, the European Union, in Turkey and in their relations for almost six decades, still provides a viable legal framework for uh, Turkey EU trade relations or not. If I don't keep my promise, which I, which I usually don't, uh, to be brief, uh, I'm sure uh, Guru Moja will interfere and uh, be very strict with me. Okay, so um, as, far as, as far as I can see, uh, there are certain views on uh, this issue, on whether the uh, current Ankara Agreement legal framework uh, is still uh, viable for the future of this relationship, of this trade relationship. And uh, those, some of those views uh, from some of the member states voiced mainly through um, Maybe sometimes some public uh, departments, governmental departments, but mainly through uh, NGOs, academics, think tanks, uh, etc. We see this quite often nowadays, and especially calls for a revised trade framework, which would require amendments to, or even totally renewing of Ankara agreements are becoming louder and louder for the last decade or so. Uh, some segments of Turkish public opinion and even some scholars, some politicians in Turkey have been supporting such viewpoint for quite a while as well. Yet, 
as far as I can see, EU institutions, especially the Commission and the Turkish bureaucracy, are not convinced that there is there is a need for an overhaul, uh, a amendment of Ankara Agreement. Uh, and the business world from both sides seem to be set against this idea. Because proponents of this idea usually argue for a free trade agreement, uh, not for deepening the integration, but maybe scaling it back, uh, even if it's uh, called a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, I would really doubt whether uh, that would cover the current requirements of the EU's renewed trade framework and Turkey's expectations. Arguably, a free trade agreement would solve the problem of asymmetry inherent in the customs union, set Turkey's hand free in managing its own trade policy with third countries, and at least to a certain extent, provide a regulatory autonomy to Turkey in many aspects of its manufacturing standards and so on. Trade and services might also be included in the new trade framework uh, agreement with EU, albeit in, I would uh, argue, very limited areas. Public procurement might be included again in some restricted areas and some improvement on the current trade regime in agricultural goods between the parties might be achieved. As we all know, these are all issues uh, under discussion uh, since the uh, beginning of the customs union revision uh, debate has started uh, and that might be achieved. Uh, moreover, some provisions on sustainability uh, Ikyoja was talking about and level playing field clauses promoted by EU within the last decade or so concerning labor or environmental protection would also be included. And the democratic or human rights conditionality, another important issue, uh, such conditionality clauses would also be incorporated into the new trade framework. All these novelties would be supplemented by a new dispute settlement mechanism, a new decision-making and consultation mechanism, which would be a remedy to the current aggravations of the parties. This might also be argued as well, and these are issues under discussion for the revision of the, uh, or for the upgrading of the customs union. In fact, there would be, uh, there would not be such a high level of integration in the new relationship, so that it should not even require a too developed consultation, decision-making and dispute settlement mechanism either. So that might even be argued, but. I would strongly oppose such a premise and such a proposal for this very reason. Such an amendment or renewal of Ankara Agreement would derail the almost 60 years of Turkey EU association relationship and would demote it to a mere free trade relationship with limited regulatory alignment requirements. Since Ankara Agreement's concrete objective is setting up a customs union between the parties in order to reach the ultimate political objective of preparing Turkey for membership in the long run, as stipulated in Article 28 of the agreement, Ankara Agreement would be obsolete and we would need to negotiate a new agreement between the parties. So, as you all know, uh, in Article 2 of uh, Ankara Agreement, uh, the uh, aim of the agreement is stated, and I quote, is to promote the continuous and balanced strengthening of trade and economic relations between the parties, while taking full account of the need to ensure an accelerated development of the Turkish economy and to improve the level of employment and the living conditions of Turkish people. And in order to attain the objective set out in this paragraph, a customs union shall be progressively established in accordance with articles three, four, and five. So the aim, the objective of a customs union is the aim of Ankara agreement. So if we are to change it to some sort of free trade agreement, of course, Ankara agreement would have to change quite radically. Not only that, 
but also Ankara Agreement provides for free movement of labor services and capital between the parties to be introduced gradually, starting with the transitional stage of the association relationship. This has always been the case. So the uh, basic legal premise for the free movement of labor services and capital is already there in Ankara Agreement. And it, I would argue that it would not be a legal requirement to change the uh, legal framework uh, so dramatically in order to include those issues into the uh, current trade framework. Yet, uh, I would also like to point to three issues or perspectives informing my opposition to uh, such a, a radical change of the legal framework. First, I would oppose it from a legal perspective because it's not really conducive to enhancing or strengthening the trade framework between the parties to satisfy the current needs. And it is in fact mostly unnecessary. Why? Because Ankara Agreement is designed as a framework agreement already, replicating the original version of Rome Treaty, its gradual approach to integration, guiding the approach to be adopted by the parties. It's a framework agreement which mainly contains provisions that provided for an aim or objective or a program which needed to be fleshed out by further decisions or measures of the institutions of the association relationship. The main provisions of Ankara Agreement are based on, inspired by, or referred to the similar provisions of the Rome Treaty establishing the European community. Moreover, it constitutes an integral part of the EU legal order and binds both the EU and its member states as a mixed agreement. When necessary, additional protocols and Association Council decisions would be instrumental in upgrading the relationship and supplementing the current legal instrument. Actually, that was the uh, case when um, parties after uh, decades of trade relations decided to finally establish the customs union. Uh, they uh, decided at the Association Council on an Association Council decision establishing the customs union between themselves as of 1st of January 1996. So uh, the whole exercise of upgrading or modernizing of the customs union is based on the current premises of Ankara Agreement already. So all those discussions about including services or public procurement, they all come from the Ankara Agreement certain provisions and the institutions and the legal mechanisms it provides, utilizing them, expanding them, enhancing them, the uh, objective might be achieved. Uh, so in that regard, it should be underlined that not only the establishment, but also the enhancement or upgrading of the customs union and paving the way for further steps as regards economic and legal alignment or integration in the area of labor services or capital can be considered as an obligation for the parties as well. So about the... Uh, instruments or tools that are already provided by the Ankara Agreement in that respect, I can refer to two provisions of Ankara Agreement in particular. Article 22, paragraph 3, uh, for the, taking decisions in the Association Council in order to further the relations. Uh, the provision states, and I quote, uh, once the trans tra transitional stage has been embarked on, the Association Council shall adopt appropriate decisions where, in the course of implementation of the Association arrangements, attainment of an objective of this agreement calls for joint action by the contracting parties, but the requisite powers are not granted in this agreement. This might sound very similar for the ones who have studied EU law uh, from an EU uh, perspective. This is uh, giving the Association Council the power to come up with all the necessary measures in order to achieve the objectives of the Association Agreement. So much 
uh, legal progress can should be uh, available under this uh, provision. And secondly, Article 25.4 of Ankara Agreement for an improved dispute settlement mechanism uh, opportunity. So it says in paragraph four, where the dispute cannot be settled in accordance with the paragraph two of this article, that is the political dispute settlement mechanism, the Council of Association shall determine in accordance with Article 8 of this agreement, the detailed rules for arbitration or for any other judicial procedure to which the contracting parties may resort during the transitional and final stages of this agreement. Here we can see that a functioning dispute settlement mechanism has already been envisaged for the final stages of uh, the association relationship, that is the stage we are in, uh, to be decided by the parties. So that would be my first opposition to a free trade agreement or a totally renewed uh, trade framework, legal framework for uh, Turkey-EU trade relations and uh, suggest that Ankara agreement is still relevant and still viable in that context. Secondly, I would oppose to such an approach of repealing the current legal basis of the relationship from a normative viewpoint. Parties do not need to demote the level of the trade relationship in order to solve their problems originating from the relationship. One can argue that this would defy the whole logic of gradual integration anyway. So uh, instead of uh, trying to find out what is not working and remedy it, it would be quite uh, unacceptable to change the legal premise in order to achieve such purposes. What kind of message this would send to Turkey and all other countries in the region aspiring for stronger trade and economic ties with the EU? What kind of a message this would convey, convey about the norm setting regulatory power identity aspirations of EU, not only in trade issues, but most probably beyond that, since the global economic and political order is shaping before our own eyes now. It's time to close the ranks, as far as I can see, more integration for the like-minded through legal rules and mechanisms, and for EU to, to reaffirm its regulatory power identity. Needless to say, an FTA will inevitably dilute the form and level of collaboration and integration between EU and Turkey and fail to provide the necessary incentives and mechanisms that would facilitate Turkey's alignment with the EU Green Deal agenda and the mandated decarbonization efforts as well. And I really do not want to dwell on the political uh, Pandora's box it might open or the problems relating to the rights of individuals deriving from the association relationship on the basis of the ECJ's established case law, but most probably at least they deserve a mention as well here. So thirdly, from a practical viewpoint as well, the difficulties created by Brexit for trade between UK and EU and all the unresolved issues relating to the level playing field and more importantly, the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol attest to the fact that rolling back, scaling back a current level of economic integration is neither easy nor beneficial to the parties economically or politically. So I would argue that parties should concentrate on honoring their legal obligations, which resulted in the mutually beneficial relationship. Certain aspects of such relationship are getting a bit old, a bit stale for some time now, and certain aspects are missing. Such parts need to be renewed in accordance with the mutually agreed upon needs of the parties within the legal frame framework provided in the Ankara Agreement. We should really be careful to not to throw the baby with the bathwater. Yet, there is one issue, which is a very strong uh, argument in favor of uh, overhauling the Ankara Agreement, and that is the democratic conditionality. So uh, I would like to touch upon that uh, as a last remark as well. Since the political identity of EU started forming in the 1970s, but mostly with the Maastricht Treaty and the European Parliament has gained sufficient muscle to flex in this area, human rights or democratic conditionality clauses have become common in EU's trade agreements. 
with reference to EU's external action being premised on its uh, values in particular, such linkages between trade and human rights conditionality or democratic conditionality have become the norm. Lisbon Treaty revisions strengthened this approach. And the EU's policies to include the clauses in the FTAs or in certain cases in political framework agreements to which trade agreements should be linked. When there is no such framework agreement, the clause uh, forms part of the agreement containing the free trade provision. So there are many such uh, examples, uh, but some earlier free trade agreements, like the association agreement with Turkey, that is the Ankara agreement, do not contain such an human rights or democratic uh, conditionality clause, since the clause was gradually introduced in the 1990s. The, so in that sense, uh, it can be argued that such a clause would be quite uh, beneficial for the relationship. Well, I would still argue uh, that democratic conditionality, although non-existent, has been in inherent or non-existent legally, has been inherent in the relations even in the early 1960s. When there was the coup in 1960 in Turkey, parties stopped negotiating the Ankara Agreement. So they, I, I would say pre-negotiations, but still, uh, Turkey had to go back to democracy in order for the uh, negotiations to resume. And in 1995 as well, in order to achieve the European Parliament's uh, approval for the Association Council decision, although legally it was not necessary, uh, the European Parliament wanted to give its uh, approval to uh, the Customs Union Association uh, Council decision. And in order to achieve that, Turkey changed, amended quite a bit of its uh, constitutional provisions and its uh, legislation in order to democratize. So we can see if the uh, environment, the political environment is conducive, then even such legal provisions are not necessary for EU to have leverage over Turkey uh, as far as political conditionality is concerned. So the main issue here is that putting such a clause in the agreement itself is not really a guarantee to achieve the desired result. Provisions do not guarantee compliance, but more engagement might help. So instead of um, trying to demote or uh, roll back the relationship, scale the level of trade relations, I think the parties should start negotiating or at least uh, come up with uh, an intention uh, of finding such negotiating uh, positions and uh, discuss this amongst themselves uh, in order to upgrade the customs union and uh, a dynamic approach towards Turkey from the EU, not taking all, only the static uh, position of Turkey for the time being, but a dynamic one would help to build a restructuring stability trust and a non-binary perspective of interest for the parties that is currently much needed. Such engagement might help building the trust very necessary, the mutual understanding and trust necessary for a functioning trade relationship. I think both parties would gain from uh, improving Ankara agreements and filling in uh, the necessary uh, framework uh, that is already there instead of trying to uh, scale it back. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hojam, for this very informative and excellent presentation. I forgot to tell Professor Gertzman was just on time, uh, as usual, uh, in his presentation. Uh, but I was not, of course. No, you are only <laughs> one minute uh, late. It is nothing. So uh, we are Miracle. still... I was scared hmm. of you, probably. Uh, 
<laughs> no, uh, of course not. Now we will have the last uh, panelist, Professor Dr. Mustafa Tayar Karait, uh, and he will be presenting um, how to overcome limitations in permits of access of Turkey shoulders to the EU internal market. Mustafa Jam, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, are you able to see now? No. Not yet. There is something wrong. I may try, Hojam, if you want. All right. All right. Uh, I sent uh, this presentation to the... Okay, I, I, I will try. Yeah. You, you share. And I will continue from here. Yes. yes. Can you see it, Hojam? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mustafa Hocam, is it okay for you? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me see my presentation. Uh, can you move the screen or should I do it for you? All right. Uh, my expose is about road transport quotas. I will uh, try to explore uh, for the answer of question how to overcome limitations in terms of access of Turkish holders to the European internal market. There are two kinds of quotas, multilateral one and bilateral quotas established on the bilateral agreements. Multilateral quota system was established in 19, 1974 within the construction of the OECD by European Conference of Minister of Transfer, Transport. Uh, it is, however, a stable uh, permit system, not uh, ena enabling the increase with the in, in commerce rate with the trade in, uh, trade volume of trade with Turkey. The other one, also, this uh, structure is uh, complementary to the bilateral agreements, which is the main structure for the road haulage. Bilateral agreements are the main structure to regulate quotas and permits. Turkey so far made 24 agreements, with the exception of Southern Cyprus, Malta, and Ireland. However, together, these, as you may see in the third uh, page on the map, these permits are not in commensurate with the potential volume and flow of the trade. Also, some member states of the EU apply different type of permits, bilateral and transit permits are the main uh, examples. Uh, some member states, Romania, Hungary, apply permits in return for payments of a fee. Because of the transit permits, lack of enough transit permits, uh, bilateral permits become useless and some trucks have to change mode of transport even to roll up truck on train and sometimes try to change transport route. The World Bank released a report with the identification that the quotas create obstacles that hinder full operation of the customs union. We are aware of the sovereignty, environmental, road safety, congestion, and domestic competitive concerns of the member states. However, we object some parts of these permits and quota system. How could we resolve the matter? I will deal with the matter in two aspects with regard to compatibility with WTO agreement. And this, in the second uh, part, I will deal with, it is compatible the, with EU law. Then within the compatible scope of, we, I will uh, look for 
what can we do to resolve the matter? The principle of freedom of transit is regulated in the fifth page, regulated by the WTO law, applicable, I think, to transportation on road. There are some deviations of direct transport to the destination, seems not compatible with Article 5 of the GATT with regard to the most convenient route, with regard to obligation not to make it subject to unnecessary delays or restrictions and unreasonable charges, and with the most favored nation clause, and also with the treaty facilitation, facilitation agreement with regard to prohibition of a disguised restriction on tariff, traffic in transit. First of all, if you look at Article 5, Paragraph one, goods and also vessels and other means of transport shall be deemed to be in transit across the territory of a contracting party. Goods and means of transport shall be deemed to be in transit in that context. Freedom of transit in that regard contains means of transport. Also in the second paragraph, the obligation to provide transit via the routes most convenient for in international transit. Change of mode of transport and also roller breaks bridge is obligation, I think. The, and also there are unnecessary delays and restrictions because of the change of mode and uh, because of the uh, other routes to be followed and also with regard to some charts applied within the context of permits. As a last obligation, the most favored nation clause to be applied to Turkey whenever it is applied as in any third country. With regard to trade facilitation agreements, Article 11 says any regulations or formalities in connection with traffic in transit imposed by a member state shall not be applied in a manner that would constitute a disguised restriction on traffic in transit. There shouldn't be a disguised, any kind of disguised restrictions on traffic in transport. And the members shall not seek, take, or maintain any voluntary restraints or any other similar measures on traffic in transit. Actually, trade facilitation agreement and WTO agreement is very respectful for the agreements, bilateral or in multilateral types related to regulating transport. However, with the condition of being consistent with WTO rules. If you come to compatibility with EU law, the, the com compatibility of uh, these quotas or permits can be assessed within the construction of dispute settlement mechanism under the WTO law. In Indian textile case, the panel stated that we have no jurisdiction to assess compatibility of the customs union within the construction under WTO law. This would be an opportunity for Turkey, whether or not the establishment, the establishment constructed by opinion 195 is the customs union in a truth sense under international trade law. If you come to compatibility with EU law, there are two main primary case law. One is Istanbul Logistic, the other one CX. Under this uh, case law, the Court of Justice consider 
transportation as a specific subject matter. It was arising in opinion 194 as a specific provision to regulate the matters also falling without the scope of the common commercial policy. It was codified in the NIST treaty and remained as part of article 207 of the treaty function of the European Union with regard to common commercial policy. According to that uh, matter, uh, the issue is to be regulated, the transport issue is to be regulated as a specific matter under the provisions relevant to transportation. In that case law, the Court of Justice considered transportation even out of the services with its special legal status. However, within the context of association law, it is considered within the context of the services. However, customs union is about the trading goods to differentiate between the regulations, measures that fall within the scope of the free movement of goods or free movement freedom to provide transport services. In Istanbul logic case, the motor vehicle tax is being considered by the Court of Justice falling within the scope of the free movement of goods matter. So in that regard, motor vehicle tax has been considered as illegal within the construction of double association law. In CX case, however, the Court of Justice considered permission out of the matter of free movement of goods, but relevant to the transportation. The main issue, the matter is within the scope of the customs union, so within the scope of the free movement of goods, or freedom to provide transport services. Even if not within the customs union project, it could be challenged on the basis of article 41 of the additional proto protocol, which has direct effect in case whenever the member states adopt measures uh, against standstill clause. So, what can be done with regard to compatible issues, compatible quotas? If the matter doesn't fall within the scope of the customs union, within the scope of the free movement of goods, there could be three options coming to my mind. An agreement complementing the customs union with a free trade area with the purpose of liberalization of services, including the road transport, could be a possible option, but not very plausible seen to me. The, the second one, the Association Council has some powers to extend scope of the customs union on the basis of Article 15 of the Ankara Agreement and on the basis of Article 42 of the Additional Protocol. It was already confirmed by the opinion of the Advocate General Koe as stated by the Association Council has power to adopt decision to extend EU transport policy provisions to Turkey. According to Article 15 of the Ankara Agreement, the rules and conditions for extension to Turkey of the transport provisions contained in the Treaty on the Function of the European and measures adopted in their implementation shall be laid down with due regard to the geographical situation of Turkey. Also, under Article 42 of the Additional Protocol, the Association Council shall extend to Turkey 
in accordance with the rules, with it shall determine the treaty function of the European Union transport provisions with due regard to the geographical situation of Turkey. So it is possible to activate the powers of the Association Council, but the European side seems to be unwilling for this option. Even though the resolution adopted by that Association Council declares that there should be agreements to be concluded with Turkey on transit or market access. We know other than Article 45, 41 of the additional protocol, the entire association law seems much more programmatic for Turkey. The third option to conclude agreements, it could be made to increase the quotas. I am talking about the compatible quotas, not illegal under both the WTO law and European law. However, it is a long process. To convince each member state would be a difficult one. The, another option to conclude a mixed agreement to get to to get uh, the EU with its member states together to conclude. However, this may also uh, cause ratification process, a very long ratification process. And in that regard, I search for the president's as an example for Turkey, the agreements to conclude. Uh, concluded by the EU, I found the best example, the agreements concluded with Hungary and Romania. In three aspects, they are very important. One, they may create a presence for Turkey because these countries are the, currently the member states of the EU and these are adopted during the accession process. The other one, the EU as a pure EU agreement, concluded these agreements, it would be easier to deal with the EU institutions in that regard and the extension of the EU competences to make it in, in a sense the shared, but to use on the base of the exclusivity the third one, the third aspect, advantage, EU granted in addition to permits allowed by the bilateral agreements by each member states, these additional permits. This would be good opportunity for Turkey to increase quotas and enable permits in commercial with the volume and flow of trade with Turkey. So if I summarize, some matters are not compatible, seem, com seem compatible, seem compatible with WTO law. And in some aspects, transportation could be considered within the context of the customs union, without which the customs union cannot function. In that regard, the establishment of customs union in that example could be assessed in the light of international trade law by the panels or appellate bodies. The second Aspect, permits, for example, permits on payments don't look like compatible with EU law as stated in Istanbul logistics, like motor vehicle tax. However, with regard to other matters, the scope of compatibility seems very narrow. So far, as what I 
as, as far as uh, I am concerned, there are three premier rulings which are given against Turkish demands. One Zibel, the other one Demirkan case, and the third one CX1. The last option, if we are within the compatible field to make an agreement with, Tur with the EU as a pure EU agreement on the basis of the presence of agreements concluded with the Hungary and Romania to resolve these quotas problem and permits to enable the customs union or the economic integration established between EU and Turkey flourished. Thank you.